Hi, this is, we're presenting the Lutheran religion, and my name is CJ Henry. My name is Henry Nguyen, and let's talk about the Lutheran religion. So first things first, before talking about how the Lutheran religion started, we need to cover exactly what the church atmosphere and culture was at the time, which spurred the origin and creation of the Lutheran religion. So overall, the church atmosphere and culture at the time really wasn't the best, wasn't on the up and up. A lot of shady things were happening where there were agreements going on over the table with literal money being exchanged under the table, whether it was for church offices or, you know, clergy not doing holy stuff, which we will discuss later. But overall, what we're going to be focusing on is 1500s Germany. And this is really important because many people believe that if Martin Luther wasn't born in 1500s Germany, if none of this happened in Germany, that the Lutheran religion wouldn't have been able to succeed for a variety of reasons, which we will cover later. So as we've already mentioned, church atmosphere is largely corrupt. It was very nepotistic in terms of who had authority. As long as you knew someone in power and liked money, you could easily get a position as a cardinal or even as a pope or so many other things because pretty much everything was financially driven. A great example that is discussed numerous times is that the sale of indulgences were used to really build up money. And this was like a pretty perpetual cycle where somebody would like bribe their way to getting a, becoming a bishop or becoming a cardinal, and then they needed money to cover how much money they invested to get this bribe. So they would use this thing called indulgences where it was basically charging people for salvation where you, know, you can go to confession and get a lot of your sins forgiven. But many people back then believed that you had to go one step further to make sure that you wouldn't have to suffer in purgatory. So the church members, specifically the ones who were corrupt, saw that, man, this is an easy, easy way to make money where if we charge people for forgiveness, they're gonna flock towards it. And it doesn't matter how much we charge. And this really made people mad because it basically stratified who was going to heaven and who could not go to heaven based on how much money you had. Because for the people that were super rich, not only could they just pay for their indulgences and view themselves as being holy, they could do this for very extreme sins as well, such as adultery, murder was maybe borderline, but there are also instances of that happening. This is a good picture right here. And this is supposed to be Martin Luther right here, just judging everyone for paying so much money to get their indulgences. And this was really unfortunate because obviously if you read the Bible and they had more access to the actual theology, they would have been like, this makes no sense as to why people were able to pay for forgiveness. Because as we read early on in this course, there used to be like a super, super long process of getting forgiven where you were separate from the congregation. You wore tattered clothes. You were like kneeling down instead of sitting. So it was supposed to be this huge, huge demonstration of penance, but now it was being reduced to just how much money would you have. So this is where in comes Martin Luther, and this is what the namesake of the Lutheran religion is based off of. So Martin Luther, here's a picture of him. He was special because he was actually bold enough to publicly and explicitly call these practices out. Even though many people noticed this, they were afraid to really go against the church powers because not only did they have a lot of influence in the church, they also had a lot of money because that's how they got their position in the first place. So many people have heard how Martin Luther, not only did he talk bad about these practices and say how they were completely unholy, he nailed them to the front of a church for everyone to see, and this was his famous 95 Theses. This occurred in Wittenberg, Germany, and this is actually a picture of the church today. And if you look really closely, there are words written on these doors, and this is supposed to commemorate and give honor to the 95 theses, which Martin Luther put on these doors. There's, there's actually some uh, debate on whether or not he actually nailed them, but we know that he at least like put them on the door for everyone to see because it sparked a lot of controversy and he, was a, he had to defend everything he said later on to a cover. But now you're probably thinking, oh my gosh, Henry, but church corruption is old news. You know, this is normal. Centuries ago, there was simony where feudal overlords were putting people in power to lay investiture because of like, you know, whoever had the more money. We talked about spiritual sisters where people in monasteries were sneaking women in to break their vow of celibacy and calling them spiritual sisters to try to get that around. Church power has always been a form to maneuver politically and get more power, get more influence in the region. And you know, this is old news. This is really, really old news. We talked about Pope sleeping with married women. 
there was a cadaver sign, which I have a picture of there. So first things first, this is Pope John the 12th. We read about him in chapter 11, which at the recording of this video was a few weeks ago. And he supposedly died because he had a stroke while he was in bed with a married woman, woman which, you know, breaks a lot of vows of celibacy, of being holy and all these things. And this is the cadaver sign that where basically the Pope here got his position very shadily. And he wanted to like destroy any doubt that this happened. So he actually dug up the grave of his biggest critic and put him on trial. And of course, you know, like a corpse is not gonna be able to defend themselves. So this Pope just had his way and like, they really desecrated the corpse, not only by digging it up, but afterwards they like cut his hand off, his right hand off, because that was the hand he's supposed to use to bless. Then they put him in the river dance. So basically, this is just to show that, you know, church corruption is super, super old news. There's, this isn't new to 1500s Germany. So why did the Lutheran religion really take off? And that's really because of the printing press right here. The printing press was able to just absolutely revolutionize how much availability and access people had to the religious text. Instead of printing out like one or two books, maybe like every month, because you had to do it like painstakingly custom, for every single book, you could use reusable type. And that was really the innovation of this printing press. It was invented by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany, which is why a lot of people believe that if Martin Luther had all of these ideas in 1500s France, 1500s Italy, 1500s Spain, you know, any other place, he may not have succeeded in creating the Lutheran religion because the printing press, you know, while it was there during like the late Middle Ages, it may not have gotten to the location. But because he was in Germany, he was one of the very first to be able to use a printing press and just use it to revolutionize religious availability and access. Because his main goal was really just to put the religious power back in the hands of the people instead of keeping it secluded and gatekept to like the really elites, the ones that were super rich, super wealthy, and were really making the church atmosphere as corrupt as it is during this time. Because before the printing press, it was really hard to get access to the Bible. Any religious text, specifically the Bible, was handwritten in secluded monasteries by hand by these monks in the monasteries. And because the monks were in secluded monasteries away from society, it was even harder to transport these texts after they were done being written away from seclusion and into the cities. So overall, this basically meant that it was super, super expensive. It was a super expensive process to write, a super expensive process to transport, and this made it very socioeconomically stratified. But this didn't just include religious texts, it also included pretty much general books. So in addition, the ability to read, the ability to be literate was also stratified to where only the really rich people could do it and the general populace couldn't. So this is what further made it possible for the wealthy to really have a stranglehold on the church powers. So just to refresh, you know, everything was handwritten. It was really, really hard to do this because it was handwritten and it took ages, especially since the Bible was so long. Then they had to be transported by very, very uh, primitive modes of transportation. They didn't have cars back then, so that took even more money. And overall, it just required a lot of money. However, after the printing press, we now had a reproducible mechanism where you could easily reproduce it. A lot of people could work on multiple books at once and it wasn't a painstaking process. So because of that, it was very streamlined. It was less costly, both to make and to distribute. So now it really could be back in the hands of the people. And more and more people now have access to their own Bible. They could form their own interpretations of theology. And they could be like, hey, it's not OK that our Pope is out here sleeping with married women. It's not OK that you know people are paying to have church authorities. It's not OK that people are making a mockery of what religion is supposed to look like. But this is really important to note that the printing press really focused on making everything available. Another thing that Martin Luther did that really changed the game was that he made the Christian faith accessible. And that was really due to how he translated the Bible from Latin to German. Because as I said beforehand, it was really tough for the normal people to be literate because almost everything was written in Latin, which at that point, you know, cost a lot of money to get tutors. It wasn't really a quote unquote normal language. It was mainly for like the quote unquote educated. So, you know, you needed money to get that. You needed money to be able to fully understand it. So instead of that, 
Martin Luther changed it from Latin to German because you know he is in Germany and that's the main language then. And this really just changed the game because it made it very accessible. A good example I can use to really emphasize the difference between availability and accessibility is like, let's say, you know, we have social media and social media at its core is just a bunch of ones and zeros because it's binary code, it's a lot of computer code. You know, if that was how social media was, we could go on Instagram, we could go on Twitter, we could go on Snapchat or whatever. But if it wasn't in our normal language, if it wasn't in English, if it wasn't in pictures, if it wasn't in videos, you wouldn't be able to access it at all, even though it is available. But because we, it is, does get translated into whatever our language is, that makes it very accessible. And that's why this translation was so revolutionary because it didn't just make it available, it made it accessible to the Christian faith and put power back in the hands of the quote unquote normal people. So before we get into the nitty gritty details, of all of the Lutheran historical timeline and how like, they have specific events. I'm gonna go over a few major changes of what Martin Luther really did compared to the normal quote unquote Christian traditions at the time. So the first thing he did was he put an increased emphasis on scripture. And that was mainly because at the time, a lot of the church authorities were very corrupt. You couldn't really trust the clergy, but you could trust the Bible, you know? So that's why he really put an emphasis on scripture and how, you know, if your priest is saying something that goes against the Bible, maybe you shouldn't listen to them. If your priest is acting in a way that, you know, isn't described in the Bible as being a good way, you shouldn't listen to them. Because there was an increased emphasis on scripture. There was, of course, a reduced emphasis on the church practices, such as a few sacraments, specifically confession and holy communion. Confession was mainly due to the fact that beforehand there were a lot of indulgences and this was really being abused. So Martin Luther was talking about how if you have your scripture, if you have good intentions, it doesn't really matter about the works you do. You don't, because for example, let's say you're super, super rich and you're very unholy, but you're going to confess and you're paying all these indulgences. You're doing a lot of good quote unquote works, but your conscience, your intentions, your mind is really bad. Holy communion was mainly once again, moving away from the clergy and how most of them weren't in the right state of mind in terms of what Luther thought would be the best mindset for clergy. But it is really, really important that he took note that Luther only changed the emphasis. He didn't get rid of church practices. He didn't say just scripture. It's very similar to this picture right here where the Bible is in front of the chalice, but neither one of them are gone. You know, the Bible isn't covering the chalice, the chalice isn't gone. And this is important because later on, we're gonna talk about a few other theologians and how they differed from Luther in this. So once again, he really wanted to take away the focus on overarching authority. He didn't want the Pope to seem like this untouchable figure where everything they did was okay, where everything they said was okay. Because as we've gone over centuries before Luther even came, church corruption was a thing and they weren't this perfect pinnacle of holiness that they turned out to be. Once again, by putting all of the religious power back in the hands of the people, he really wanted everyone to be a type of priest of themselves the priesthood of all believers, the priesthood of all baptized. He didn't want everyone to focus on just the pastor as being the only connection to God. He wanted everyone to have their own connection because a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. However, a Christian should also be serving, so they are a perfectly dutiful servant to all, subject to all, because you know the terms of religion were supposed to not be selfish, so on and so forth. But as always, Lutheran wanted this to people to realize that they have their own power and will and ability to become more holy, which is why they are a free Lord of all, but they should still subject themselves to other because that's what Jesus did. Lastly, Luther also had a lot of trouble in uh, getting everyone to fully understand what he meant because a lot of people, whenever they heard, oh, it's only about your intention, you don't need to do good works or whatever, a lot of people skipped out on mass and he got really mad about that because there was one service he did where no one showed up and he said, you ungrateful beasts are not worthy of this treasure of the gospel. Because many of them are like, well, you know, if my heart is good and my soul is good, God will save me, right? I don't have to go to mass, I don't have to do anything. And that was really against what Luther stood for. So that was pretty much a broad overview of the Lutheran religion. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Sanjay and she's gonna go over the nitty gritty details. So before I dive um, extremely deep into what kind of led up to the development of the Lutheran religion, I kind of want to go into like the metamorphosis of Martin Luther real quick. So Martin Luther was born in 1483 in Saxony. Um, he was in the territory state of the Holy Roman Empire and is now considered Northeast Germany today. 
He began his education in 1501 in the University of Erfurt, um, and he went to the University of Erfurt in Erfurt, Germany. He initially wanted to be he initially wanted to be a lawyer. He sought to get a law degree because his father was a lawyer. But in 1505, he was caught in a thunderstorm. This thunderstorm just wasn't any. Um, Martin Luther was very terrified of this thunderstorm. He was so terrified that he cried out to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors. And he basically vowed to become a monk if she got him out of that thunderstorm alive. So he was so scared that he made a sacred vow. And for Martin Luther, growing up in the faith and being a lawyer, his word was considered to be sacred, especially since his father was a lawyer. So the fact that he grew up around, you know, owning your word and growing up and knowing that whatever you say you have to do, and that if this is a mortal sin that's set in stone, it kind of made you, it makes you understand why he ended up forcing the Roman Catholic Church to go through a type of metamorphosis of their own, because his principles were so built on owning your word and owning what is written which kind of goes into the Lutheran religion. So after the thunderstorm in 1507, he basically decided to drop out of his current university, which was the University of Erfurt. And he became an ordained priest in 1507. And then in 1512, he obtained his doctor of divinity, which allowed him to be really knowledgeable in the Catholic religion. So this kind of starts our journey into basically the Lutheran, the Lutheran religion and why Martin Luther went through these types of changes. So on October 31st, 1517, about five years after he became um, ordained in the Doctor of Divinity, Martin Luther stamped the 95 Theses on the doors. Why did Martin Luther um, stamp the nail these 95 theses to the door of the chapel of Wittenberg Castle. He did this mainly because of the indulgences that the Catholic Church was doing. Indulgences is not a part of the Bible, nor did it come out of the Bible. So when Martin Luther started to see a change in the Catholic Church, and mainly due to the corruption within it, he decided to take it upon himself to write down all his complaints in the 95 Thesis highlighting the problems with indulgences and everything that basically the Catholic Church got wrong in their teaching and he posted it onto the door. He basically did this by expressing his disapproval. And then you get into June 1520. This goes into the Papal Bull, which was issued by Rome. This literally told Luther to recant all his ideas, all everything he said in the 95 Theses, so that he can not only bring back or restore the faith that people lost in the Catholic Church, but just so the Catholic Church can continue doing their um, corruption. But instead, Martin decided to burn the papal bull that was sent to him, and that ended up causing him to be excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. We then move into January, January of 1521. This is called the Diet of Worms. This is when basically Charles V declares Luther a criminal and bans all of his writing. And this goes further into the fact that he burned up their issue to recant their idea and basically the fact that he was um, telling or doing a whole bunch of teachings to people to basically get their awareness up on the fact that the Catholic Church is being so corrupt. Then we get into August 1526, which goes into the diet, the first diet of the spirits, which was when a council, a council of people kind of came together to determine how a reform might be done or what would be like the guidelines of what a reform might be. But since there was no definitive way or line to um, go into reformation, each kingdom at the time decided to implement Luther's reform and thus separate the Catholic Church from, the, from Rome. But in doing this, you also the kingdom also basically forced each place to determine if they were going to be Catholic or if they were going to practice Lutheranism. So due to this, if you chose to be Catholic, you 
or had to live in a specific state and it was fine. But if you chose to be Lutheran, you had to live in a specific state and it was fine there. Then you got into March 4th, March 4th of 1529, which is the second time in spirit. And that goes into basically how the Lutheran reform is only being tolerated in a specific kingdom. So it goes back to the first diet when they split each kingdom into whether it's going to be Catholic or Lutheran. So if you are in a Lutheran kingdom, then you're tolerated. They don't suppress your freedom of religion and they allow you to do your practices. But if you choose to, if you are still living in a kingdom or a state where um, it mainly practices Catholic religion, then you are not tolerated. You're basically hated and your suppression or your um, freedom of religion is basically suppressed. So the only real religion that was allowed to be practiced in any and every state was the Catholic religion. So if you were living in a state or a kingdom in which it was primarily, or it was okay with you practicing Lutheran religion, it was also okay with you to practice Catholic. But if you were in the other state that only practiced Catholic, you were condemned if you were Lutheran. And it basically went into revoking the whole first side of the worms, allowing it to be okay if you lived in either ones, because if you were Lutheran in the wrong state, then you were condemned. Which goes into the Augsburg Confession, which happened January 25th, 1530. The Augsburg, the Augsburg Confession basically became the foundational doctrine of the Lutheran church for reformation for Christians. So it basically became the main source um, to go to when it came to reforming the church. Right after January 25th, 1530, about 16 years later is when Martin Luther died. And before his death, he was um, really doing a lot of reformations, going to different places to really argue on the fact that not only is the Catholic Church wrong in what they're doing to its people and doing the teachings, but he was really pushing for the fact that many people should be allowed to read the Bible for their own, to get a better understanding of the Bible for them own, for his own. So even though he did die in 1546, his work still lived on. And even through that 14 to 16 year period before his death, he was doing a lot to really not only start up the printing press with Johannes, but he also used that as a way to transition the Latin version of the Bible to a German um, dialect to allow all people to be able to read it. After his death, you did get one last major historical fact, which was the Peace of Augsburg, which happened in September, 1555. This basically ended the fighting in Europe between the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire, which is Charlie, Charles V, basically Charles V, and the Protestant princes of Germany, all those that wanted to reform the church. This kind of established the fact that princes could choose their own religion in their own territory, basically recognizing Lutheranism as a religion or a new type of religion. Now we're gonna dive into the Lutheran holidays because there are many, and many of these holidays are the same holidays that you would see in the Catholic religion, or in all different forms of Christian religions, whether it's non-denominational or um, Calvinism or any of them. So the first up is Christmas, or you can call it nativity. This always happens December 25th. This is the celebration of God's son, which is Jesus, and basically the birth of him in the major with Mary and Joseph being his parents. Then you have the holiday Epiph Epiphany, it's a Christian feast day that celebrates the revelation of God's incarnate as Jesus Christ. It basically highlights the revelation of Jesus as like your Lord and Savior. It can also be called the King's Day, but that's traditionally held January 6th because the three kings in the story of the Bible, the three kings had came and gave gifts to Jesus in the major. The next holiday is Baptism of Our Lord. 
Um, this is a feast day commemorating the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. Originally, the baptism of Christ was celebrated on Epiphany Day, which commemorates the coming of the Magi. But over time, um, the celebration came to be commemorated as a distinct feast from uh, Epiphany Day. So it's actually celebrated now on the first Sunday after January 6th, so after the Epiphany Day. Then the next holiday is the Transconfiguration. Transconfiguration is held on August 6th. And it's basically, um, it, it's an event in where Jesus is basically carried up or transfigured or basically ascending and becoming radiant in the glories above the mountain. So it's seen as basically when Jesus was going up into the sky. And this is stated quite frequently in the New Testament. Then you have the, uh, the Annunciation, the Annunciation, which is known as the Annunciation to the Blessed Virgin Mary or of Our Lady, or it can be the Annunciation of the Lord. So there's many names to this um, holiday but it's mainly celebrated on March 25th. Um, this celebration is the announcement of the age of Gabriel, when Gabriel announced himself to Mary that she would be not only conceiving and bearing a son called Jesus Christ, but that he told her what the name of her child would be. And he told her it would be Jesus, meaning the word Yahweh, which is salvation. Palm Sunday is typically celebrated April 10th. And it's a feast that commemorates Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, an event mentioned in each of the four canonical um, gospels. And Palm Sunday marks the first day of the Holy Week. So at the top right is the Transconfiguration holiday. As you can see, Jesus is being lifted above the rest. So he is literally being levitated or flying or transcending above everyone else. And then at the bottom is a picture that depicts the Annunciation. The Annunciation is again, the Annunciation to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as you can see here, the lady who everyone is looking at is um, the Blessed Virgin Mary in this case. So we do have more holidays, next being Easter. Um, we all remember Easter as being celebrated 40 days either after Fat Tuesday, or it can be one day after April's first full moon. And Easter is typically a Christian festival or a cultural holiday commemorating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, described in the New Testament as having occurred on the third day of his burial following his crucifixion by the Romans at Calvary. The next holiday is the Ascension or also known as the Ascension of Jesus. Um, the, the ascension of Jesus is the Christian teaching that Christ physically departed from earth by rising into the heaven. And basically the Christian teaching that goes into the presence of his um, all 11 of his apostles. And this day is known as May 26th. Then we have the Pentecost, which the it commemorates the day when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples in Jerusalem after the um, crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's basically when we talk about the Holy Spirit being poured out um, on the disciples in Jerusalem after the crucifixion, we're, we're talking about Jesus's blood. So that Holy Spirit is being shown in you know, Jesus's blood. And this marks, um, this marks the day in the beginning of the Christian church that we know it. So this is like the beginning of when the Christian church 
I guess, officially begin um, with the death of Jesus Christ. And this is June 5th, is the day that is commemorated. Then we have the Holy Trinity. The Feast of the Holy Trinity, or also known as Trinity Sunday, which celebrates the Christian doctrine of basically the Holy Trinity, the three persons of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how they all kind of make up God himself. This is the first Sunday after the Pentecost, so literally whichever first um, Sunday of that month. And then we have All Saints Day, which can also be known as Hallows Day or Hallowmas or the Feast of All Hallows, or um, basically we're talking about the Day of Saints. And the Day of Saints is um, a day to venerate all the holy men and women who have basically been canonized by the church. So they have been recognized by the church and it doesn't always have to be someone who is known. It can also be unknown um, saints as well. And this day is November 1st. The last real known holiday is Christ the King Day which can also be known as Christ the King Sunday or Reign of Christ Sunday. And it's a feast in a liturgical year, which emphasizes the true kingship of Christ, recognizing that he is a king and will always be our king. And this is recognized as the day of October. And the picture on your top right is um, the picture of Christ the King Day. So it was one of the main pictures to represent to represent God and him being a king. And then the one on the bottom is the Ascension. And, and that's shown um, basically as the dove rising above in all its glory. So Lutheran lit liturgy is basically the same, it has a lot of the same liturgy, liturgy as you would see in a lot of um, Catholic churches or a lot of non-denominational or Calvinism churches or Calvin churches and basically, or just any real Christian church. And one of the main forms of this you can see is how it has like a structure to the framework of how they do their actual church worship. So there's like, um, there's a distinct structure um, for a st um, scripturally based and historically correct based patterns of worship. And this can include hymns that they sing. They have particular hymns. One that Lutheran religion likes to use is in the cross of Christ I glory and Lord let us walk your servant way. Is one of your is one of the favorite hymns for the fact that it breaks down how Christians or how Lutherans should basically walk in the Lord and how they should rely on the teachings and scriptures of the Lord. And then the communion is another form of liturgy only for the fact that many Christian religions do it and it's built off of also the Catholic religion and eating the bread and the wine, which represents the body and the Christ, or the body um, of Christ and the blood of Christ. Then we have decorating the altar or the elements that kind of go into decorating the altar, which some of these elements can be seen as the symbol of Trinity. So um, the symbol that shows the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which can be on the altar. You can also see the Bible, which is the Holy Scripture, the written word of God. You would also see the chalices, which many use in order to drink the wine that signifies the blood of Christ. And those would be decorating the altar as well as candles and um, as well as the cross. Then we have worship music. So worship music can be broken down into liturgical and not liturgical forms. So most um, actual churches like non-denominational churches use non-liturgical forms while Lutheran churches use liturgical forms which is basically a more rigid structure so they have specific words that you don't really see to me. Um, praise dancing, and it's not really um, too much of um, burst, outburst of like dancing or people yelling. It's very structured and it's, um, it has a particular setting to it. 
is very formal in the way you do it in the practice. Then you have the um, what's called the procession or proceed as or proceed for short, which is basically short petitions that are or short um, verbiage um, or even phrases that are said or sung in a response to either what the pastor or what the priest says, or it's a way for the congregation to respond back to the pastor. And then we go into the confession. And the confession is a practice taken back from pre-Reformation um, roots before the Lutheran church kind of broke away from the Catholic church. And this is just a symbol of um, this is just a symbol of the people or the worshipers or I guess God's followers within the church to confess their sins to a priest or a person who is a divine representative of God on earth and to be able to not only rid ourselves of the sin but to seek forgiveness and salvation. So that's also a practice of what confession comes from. And through these pictures on the bottom left that the bread in the chalice signifies the communion. So this is a lot of times is what it would look like. Then in the middle, when you see the procession or the proceed and response, it's basically the practice of the call and worship. So when the priest says something, the congregation has a response. And then just the chalice, one of the elements that can decorate the altar itself. So going into Lutheran percentages, we're kind of break down how many people we have in this world or continent or even state and see how, or even state or city to see how many people are actually um, practicing Lutheran versus how many people practice a different type of religion or another form of Christianity. So globally, we have less than 1%. And though that seems very low, we have to remember that we have more than 7.9 billion people in this world. So there's probably roughly around 77 billion to 77, no, we have a roughly around 77.5 million people who claim the actual Lutheran religion as of 2021. And though this is a huge number, because it's 77.5 million, we do have also 7.9 billion. So it's only a small percentage of people in the world that actually practice Lutheran religion. When we make our population size smaller, so instead of looking at globally, we look at only our continent being North America, we then get into a smaller amount. So within North America, we have roughly 600 million people in North America, which is great but we still have less than 1% because 0.61% of those actually make up the Lutheran religion. And that being the number of people that would be is 3.7 million people. So 3.7 million people in North America actually practice Lutheran religion. Then we have the city of New Orleans. So within New Orleans, we only have about 1 million people um, just a little bit under 1 million people that are within New Orleans. And within that, we still have only 0.8% that are Lutheran. And that makes about 647,000 mil people who actually practice a Lutheran religion. So each time the percentage or the amount of people went down, but it didn't really increase our numbers. And that's just um, due to the fact that not many people within the world or really North America or New Orleans practice Lutheran. But in Africa or the Nordic countries like Germany, Sweden, or um, any other ones, they typically have more people who are considered Lutheran um, than North America. And that's really because the Lutheran um, religion stemmed from Germany, it came from Germany, it started in Germany with its Catholic church. So it makes a lot more sense for a lot, for the main religion in those Nordic countries or in Africa to be Lutheran. 
So next we have the amount of Lutheran celebrities or what Lutheran, so, uh, what celebrities are actually Lutheran and one being David Letterman. So David Letterman is, um, based, David Letterman is a type, he is a, a, so he is a comedian, I'm sorry. So he's a comedian and he's an after night um, person who talks on the television. And he was blackmailed over the fact that he was having an affair. And due to this, he decided to say on live television that he's a tower of Western, Midwestern Lutheran guilt. So he was admitting the fact that, yes, he did what he did, but also that he's a Lutheran and he's guilty of having an affair. Next, we have Dana Carvey. So Dana Carvey, Mr. Carvey, Mr. Carvey, he's famously known for his Saturday Night Lives. And on this Saturday Night Live, he has a character who he based off of a church, of a Lutheran church lady who he used to always talk with when he was younger and when he used to go to the Lutheran church with his mom. So that really kind of helped, that kind of really shaped who he is and that kind of proved um, that when he was growing up, he was also Lutheran. Then we have Dale Earnhardt. And Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Sr., him and his father, are both Lutheran. But Dale specifically, he proposed to his then girlfriend at the time. Um, his, it's his ex-girlfriend now. But he then was going to propose to his um, ex-girlfriend inside of a German Lutheran church. And basically, it kind of showed that he had generate, he kind of grew up in that church and he had generations of basically family of generations of his family growing up within that church. And it was like a historical place of worship for him. So that was nice. And then we had Andy Richner. So Andy Richner is known as a comedian. He's an actor, he's a writer, he's a known talk show host. But Andy Richardson is reportedly a Lutheran. He once joked um, that he shelled out $40,000, $400,000 on a Lutheran bar mitzvah for his nine-year-old son. So even Lutherans can have fun. Next, we have Jack um, Kafriti. Kafriti. He's a news commenter, and he said he also attended a Lutheran church, but he's, no, he's not really huge or really big into religion, but that he likes being able to study the word for himself, and he likes the fact that it's not built off of a priest. Last, we have Rick Steves. So Rick Steves, he's a travel host. Most of you probably also seen him on television. He is also Lutheran. Um, he said once that he went on a pilgrimage through um, Martin Luther's lands to learn more about um, the historical revelations that went around him. And he appreciated what a blessing it is to have the freedom to explore the world of God in my own language and how hard earned that privilege was. So he was basically bringing to light or he wanted to know more about what Martin Luther did because he is, he is German, he is Lutheran, and he wanted to know all the great things that Martin Luther did, like change the Bible from Latin into the German dialect. So I'm going to pass this back over. Let's cut it right here. No. All right, everyone. So now we're just going to go over our church visit that we went on and just our personal takeaways from that. So our church visit occurred at Mount Zion Lutheran Church, which is right here in New Orleans. It is the oldest Black Lutheran church in New Orleans. It was established in 1878. They recently had their 140, 140th commemoration a few years ago in 2018, I believe. And it is located on 1401 Simon Boulevard Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70113. And the specific one we went to is the 9 a.m. Sunday Divine Worship Service for January 30th, 2022. This is a picture of Mount Zion Lutheran Church from the outside. This is specifically from 
the right side. So it's not head on. You'll see a picture of head on for our next slide. And here's a picture of the current pastor, which we uh, was able to see during our church visit. So the main differences from Catholicism that I saw because I was raised as a Catholic is the architecture, which does make sense because Luther, the Lutheran religion was all about like going away from extravagance and being more simple and stopping the wealthy from taking over. And this was very evident in how, so this is Mount Zion head on on the left. And this is the Catholic church that I usually go to in my hometown on the right. And this is like, you know, this is just gigantic. It's a lot more stained glass, it's much more ornate. And this is a very common theme amongst most Catholic churches. While not all Lutheran churches look, look like Mount Zion, most of them will be simpler in design, mainly because they don't want that ornateness. But what I will say is that whenever I did visit Mount Zion Lutheran Church in person, just to like get a feel for it, it's much less intimidating than Catholic churches. Because like, for example, like this building to the right of St. Mary Madeline Catholic Church, this is about the same size as St. Joe's. So you can just see like just how tiring it is. So that's one thing I really did like about the Lutheran religion uh, in our visit, it was very approachable. And this also translated to the inside because the inside was also much less ornate than you know all of these beams, these Gothic spires, these really ornate Roman pillars. They usually have uh, banners here, but this picture right here doesn't have. But as you can tell, it's much larger, <laughs> it's much more ornate, and as I said, it does tend to be more intimidating than someone who is like new to the Catholic religion. So that's one thing I liked about the Lutheran religion. It's much more approachable, and it makes sense. And uh, more than Luther cared about the priesthood of all believers. In addition, the Eucharist was very different in how pretty much everything that happened there in the Lutheran church, the pastor faced away from us. And this was mainly to show that like, you know, the pastor wasn't above us, the pastor wasn't doing anything super, super special. And he was just like a proxy to God, but he wasn't like in place of God. Whereas for the Catholic religion that I'm used to, you know, it's a very huge ceremony. There's a lot of bells ringing, a lot of things like that. And it is a huge, huge ceremony for the Eucharist, whereas for Lutheran religion, it was much more low key. And then another thing I picked up that didn't occur during the church, but occurred because we went keeping up with the Facebook page is that the Lutheran religion really does place more emphasis on the scriptures and how like they really do call uh, Lutheran believers to memorize a certain part of scripture every week. And I thought that was really interesting because it really does live out the values that more than Luther set out whenever he started this religion. So now I'm gonna go into how basically the Lutheran church is different from non-denominational non non church, which as only you kind of see, there's not too much of a difference besides the authority. So the authority, for Lutherans, they have a doctrine or they really kind of advocate for a doctrine of justification, which is by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of scripture alone. So this is basically telling all followers of the Lutheran church that we only, the only thing that matters, the main justification that you take out is that we are saved through the grace of God and that comes through the faith that you have in God, and you get that through the scripture. So the fact that the last part is scripture alone kind of tells you that the doctrine is built off of the fact that the scripture is the final authority on all matters of faith. So Lutherans do not believe in having a priest or a divine representation of God on earth that speaks God's word or teaches God's word, mainly because of what happened in the beginning um, back in Martin Luther's time with the whole corruption of the Catholic Church, but also for the fact that the only real true um, tenets or the only time where you kind of know what God wants you to do is through the Bible. And so they realized that back in um, the uh, 1500s, when the only way for them to understand or really grasp what God wanted them to do is when they were able to read it in the Bible for themselves, which is also the reason why the priest turns away, as we stated before, from the congregation, from the congregation because um, they are trying to show respect to God, remind themselves that they are not the divine representation um, of God on earth, they are also a servant and followers, so they also look towards 
the cross when they do any of their hymns or do say any of their prayers. So now we're gonna look at the non-denominational faith, which basically believes in having a divine representation. So we, so we do have a pastor, we do have a preach, pre, priest, and they do look towards the congregation. So they face away from the cross. And this isn't out of disrespect towards God, but it's for, but um, for non-denominational or Catholic religion, it's typically, they're seen as our divine representation. They were given the blessings and authority from God to speak um, his divine word. So in that case, they can look towards us as they teach us the scripture and the word. So now we go into the differences of basically the Lutheran religion and um, when it comes to the Holy Trinity. So the Holy Trinity is basically when you have the representation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's this understanding that all three of those kind of make up God. But what makes Lutherans different in this idea that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit make up God is that Lutheran kind of re Lutherans kind of reject the idea that the Father and the God, the, that the Father and God the, and the Son are merely faces of the same person. So he doesn't believe in that you have three faces to one God. They believe that they're all kind of separate people. So they get this idea from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. They kind of say how in the Old Testament, God is very revengeful. Um, if you um, start worshiping or another God or you start idolizing something, they really show God as being vengeful. Uh, while in the New Testament, he's more forgiving. He wants you to love your neighbors and he kind of preaches more on forgiving which both New and Old Testament make up the Bible, but in this, that the Lutherans distinctualize God as being two separate people. So in this fact, the Lutherans believe that the Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son, but they do not see them as one unity, as most non-denominational, well, as non-denominational in Catholic Church does. For, for us, the unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit comes into one person. So God is the Father, He is the Son, He is the Holy Spirit, and they are God. But for us, those three are not each other, and they're basically very different from what you would see as being God. All right, everyone, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. But one last thing I want to say is that, as you can tell, me and Sanjay, we had the exact same service, but we drew completely different conclusions. And that's actually gonna happen with Martin Luther and how it was so noble that he wanted to give access to everyone, but everyone gets different interpretations and that leads to different religious views. And that's pretty much the end of chapter 14. And we did have some slides that we wanted to cover for that, but this video is already running really long. So we're gonna have to cut it here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Bye.